Good morning. I noticed that Dr. Halverson gave a public service announcement on Monday. I thought I would take opportunity as well. I can understand why, from a distance, the construction site on Carter may look like the world's greatest jungle gym. It's not. So my encouragement to you all, particularly you GoPro-wearing, parkour-loving, American Ninja Warrior wannabes, for your own safety, please stay off. There is severe fines, criminal charges, and I haven't read the fine print, but your firstborn may be up for them as well. <laughs> but mainly, we want you guys to be safe, to be wise. So, end of public service announcement. Today, I'd like to talk to you all about friendship. Never worn one of these before. I'm freaking out a little bit. Excuse me. It looks good. Thank you. <laughs> I know this isn't the spirit of friendship chapel. That's typically in the spring. But I want to talk today about the spirit of friendship, particularly in light of what we are hearing about nationwide as an epidemic of depression, anxiety, and doubt among people in your season of life. I wanted to consider how we can care for each other in this season and what wisdom we can glean together from Scripture. Oftentimes, the deepest, uh, the most fulfilling, the richest relationships come as a result of self-forgetting friendship and service to somebody else. Unfortunately, we're perhaps more prone to assess what we can get out of a relationship before we get into it. Try, uh, Eugene Peterson describes it like this. Each of us has contact with hundreds of people who never look beyond our surface appearance. We have dealings with hundreds of people who the moment they set eyes upon us begin calculating what use we can be to them, what they can get out of us. We meet hundreds of people who take one look at us, make a snap judgment, and then slot us into a category so that they won't have to deal with us as persons. They treat us as something less than we are, and if we're in constant association with them, we become less. But then, someone enters our life who isn't looking for someone to use, someone who's leisurely enough to find out what's really going on in us, is secure enough not to exploit our weaknesses or attack our strengths, who recognizes our inner life and understands the difficulty of living out inner convictions and actually confirms that which is deepest within us. This is a friend. As image bearers of a triune God, we are actually made for friendship. In fact, it is not good for us to be without friends. The Trinity has enjoyed from all eternity communion, fellowship, and friendship. I fear, though, that sometimes we settle for less than true biblical friendship because we don't know what we're called to. So what does this type of friendship look like? I want to point to a, a brief snippet, of a vignette from the life of David. 1 Samuel 23, verses 15 to 18. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear. For the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. I pray now that you would open our eyes, open our hearts. To these truths. May I not be a stumbling block, Father, but um, your mouthpiece speaking your truths uh, to these brothers and sisters today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Three things I want us to look at. I want to look at David and the normalcy of doubt. Look at Jonathan and the power of presence. And finally, I want to look at that phrase, strengthening one another's hands in God's hands. First, I think some background. Where is David and, and why? What we do know is that chapter 23 falls right in the middle of chapters 18 through 30, where David is constantly on the run for his life. He's being pursued relentlessly by Saul, driven from place to place. Right now, in this story that I read, he's in Ziph, about 23 miles southeast of Jerusalem. 
We know from Scripture that David is the man after God's own heart. We know that he is the Lord's anointed, the next prince of the people of God. We know Saul has tried to kill David at least six times, um, three times with a spear, uh, two times by pledging David's uh, pledging his daughters to David in marriage if David goes out against superior forces to fight with the hope that David will be overcome. One of these stories ends up with probably at least a top 10 worst dowry gift ever, 200 Philistine foreskins given to Saul as a dowry. The final opportunity, a death squad, an assassination attempt as David sleeps, he's warned he's away before Saul and his cronies are allowed to kill him. So six times he's tried to kill him. We know he's been pursuing him, trying to kill him again. We know that Jonathan, Saul's son, is David's closest friend. They've made a covenant with one another. And we know that the surrounding tribes and cities have been selling David out to Saul. That's what we know. What can we surmise? What can we reasonably infer? I believe we can infer that David is exhausted, that David feels betrayed and alone, that David is struggling with doubt, that David is anxious, and that David must wonder if God has forgotten his promises and even forgotten him altogether. So what does this mean for us? I think we need to identify with David in this story, that David's struggles are not dissimilar to our own struggle. We may not be hiding in caves as a king hunts for our lives, but we know what it is to feel alone, to feel anxious, to have doubt, to wonder if God has forgotten about me, to wonder if anybody cares. I'd love to normalize (laughs) doubt for us today. Some of you here last spring took our National College Health Assessment. In that assessment, you were asked about um, stressors or indicators that impact your academic life. The top three reported academic impacts by Covenant College students, stress, anxiety, and depression. 60% of you felt overwhelming anxiety at least once in the past year. 40% of you reported feeling so depressed at least once last year that it was difficult to function. But this isn't unique to Covenant. These are hard times to be a college student. Uh, Lots of things come across my email as I hear from colleagues, as I read about the lies telling us we need to look perfect that you um, have to look effortlessly perfect without showing any effort at all. Uh, These lies to be perfect have become potentially life-threatening and certainly a life-diminishing aspect of our culture. There's pressure on campus um, to look happy and assured when secretly stressed and sad. In some places, according to the New York Times, it's known as the duck syndrome. I shared this with the new students a couple weeks ago, but it's the picture of a duck. We glide effortlessly along with our idyllic lives, our perfectly framed Instagrams, our um, effortless demeanor, and all the while, under the surface, we're paddling frantically just to stay afloat. It's true for non-Christians, and it's certainly true for Christians. Doubt and anxiety are not foreign concepts in Scripture. The Psalms are full of honest doubt, honest struggle, many of them written by David himself. In the New Testament, I believe five of the most poignant words fall in Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Listen to this. Jesus asked the Father, how long has this been happening to him? This is the man's son who's been convulsing in like epileptic seizures. And the man said, from childhood, it's often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the f- boy's father cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. I said, I think those are five of the most poignant words in scripture because I think we can all identify with that at some point. All of us fall on that continuum of I believe, help my unbelief, that continuum of faith and doubt, sometimes different places on the very same day. If you're here this morning struggling with doubt, welcome. 
This does not make you an outlier. It does not make you strange. It makes you part of the family. We're spiritual descendants of doubters. We come by it honestly. The whole of Scripture is replete with examples of doubters, of unfaithful, of unbelieving. In fact, at the Great Commission, we read this. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that amazing? He goes on then to commission them for the work of making disciples. Doubt doesn't disqualify you for service to the kingdom, but do recognize the enemy's use of it. It's been the tactic of the devil since the garden to attack God's integrity, to cast doubt on his credibility. Did God really say that? It continues today. Is God faithful? Is he who he says he is? Can he be trusted? Does he speak the truth? Does he love me? David's words in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, are the words that Jesus actually uses on the cross. At the moment of his most intense pain of abandonment and struggle, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But notice, he directs his doubt, he directs his concerns, he directs his anguish to God. And that's what we are to do as well. This serves as a pattern for us. We, in turn, should be directing our doubts in honesty to God, the Father, and in turn, sharing them with one another as well. Shout them to God, share them with friends. The temptation is to keep our fears, our doubts, and our anxieties to ourselves. It somehow means I'm not as good of a Christian, that I'm somehow weird to be at a Christian college and have doubts, but the opposite is the best recourse. When you're in a downward spiral of doubt and despair, the worst thing to do is to keep it in. We should share our fears with others, share our doubts with others, and in turn, they ought to be about pointing us continually back to God to share them with him. Secondly, we have Jonathan, an example of someone who does this very thing. We know Jonathan is the son of the current king, but he's also the best friend of the rightful king. Awkward. He's divided in his loyalties. He could have simply prayed. He could have sent a note. Uh, he's the child of the king. He could have sent an emissary. But Jonathan went. There's power in presence. In Jonathan, we see someone who's willing to go to his friend to intentionally put himself out there for the good of his friend. Friendship is intentional, ultimately. It knows and it goes. David anticipated, I mean, Jonathan knew something, how, how David must be feeling at this time. He took time to consider this and went to him. There's a parable that I may have shared in years past. I, I share it here again as an example of what it means to be a friend. A man was walking through a town one day, his town, and fell into a hole. I don't know why the hole was there, but he fell into the hole and couldn't get out of the hole. And so, as time passed, a doctor came by. The doctor looked into the hole. The man saw the doctor and said, Doctor, doctor, I'm, I'm stuck in this hole. Can you please get me out of this hole? The doctor looked at him, considered the situation, wrote a prescription, dropped it in the hole, and walked away. A short time later, a priest walked by, looked down, saw the man in the hole. The man said, Father, Father, I'm stuck down in this hole. I can't get out. Can you please help me get out of this hole? The priest looked, uh, considered the man's situation, uh, wrote a prayer, and dropped it into the hole. The man held his prescription and his prayer when a friend walked by. The friend came. The friend looked down. The man saw his friend. He said, my friend, my friend, I'm stuck in this hole. I can't get out of this hole. Will you please help me? The friend considered the situation of the man in the hole and jumped in. The man in the hole said, are you crazy? I was stuck in this hole, now we're both stuck down here. You could have gone for help, you could have gotten me a rope. The friend said, relax. I've been in this hole before. I know the way out. Follow me. Jonathan was willing to go into the hole at personal risk to himself. As the son of the king, as the heir normally to the throne, Jonathan was a person of extreme privilege, but he lays all of this aside to go to his friend. 
My pastor was sharing recently about a, the three-step dance of the Christian life. Repent, believe, obey. Repent, believe, obey. As believers in relationship with one another, in relationship with the triune God, we are called to do this dance every day. And in this, we have Jesus as our ultimate example. Christ is our lead to follow in that he actually did repent. Philippians 2 shows us the ultimate repentance by Jesus as he turned away from his divinity, away from his privilege, as he believed and trusted his Father's plan to come to earth, to live among us, to love us, and then ultimately his obedience, even to death on the cross for our sake. This is our model, and it's the model that Jonathan sets for us as well. Jonathan was a son of a different king who essentially repented and denied himself his privilege out of love for his friend. Just as Jesus held loosely to the point of emptying himself, Jonathan also laid his life on the line by forsaking his rights for the sake of his friend. So should we also not be willing to identify with our privilege and lay it aside in order to engage with others and love them well? The reality is friendship with David complicated Jonathan's life. He sacrificed his father's favor and his own royal inheritance. He risked his father's anger, even to the point of his own safety, and put his life in danger in going to David. But that's the point. He went. He laid aside his privilege to be present. He went to David and was with David in his pain and in his doubt. Jonathan Holmes writes that Jesus, through his death on the cross, befriends us, so that we in turn can go and be friends with others. At the cross, the Godhead's friendship was ruptured so that our friendship could be restored. The eternal communion, fellowship, and friendship which the Godhead had enjoyed in eternity past were all temporarily broken at the cross. But in that breaking, as God poured out his wrath on Jesus, he restored the friendship that had been broken by our sin. We are to move towards one another just as God has always moved towards us. God always has taken the initiative. Even after exiling Adam and Eve, he pursued them. Jesus put on flesh, laid aside his divinity, and pursued us. He entered our lives and lived among us. As Christians, we are called to nothing less. Christ took the initiative. We must take the initiative as well. Finally, let's look at that phrase, what Jonathan did when he did finally reached David that day. Jonathan not only laid aside his best interest to be with him and to minister to him, but the text says that he then strengthened his hand in God. What a beautiful phrase that is, strengthened his hand in God. It literally can mean put David's hand in God's hand. So what exactly does this mean? First, I think it's important to define what it's not. It's not building up someone's self-esteem. It's not strengthening their belief in themselves. Jonathan didn't travel all that way to build up David's self-confidence. Jonathan didn't take David's hand, as it were, and put it in the hand of a self-help group. It's not about making someone feel better about him or herself. It's also something that it's not. It's not strengthening uh, someone's grip on your own hand becoming their surrogate savior. And this can be hard for us to hear because we kind of like that role. I think we can find our identity in it sometimes. We can be prone to codependency, addicted to being needed, and that can be a very dangerous thing. No, what Jonathan did was remind David in the midst of his doubts of who his God is and what his God had promised. He spoke God's word to David. And that is the true, sure, and lasting encouragement that we can bring. Encouragement from God for the people of God comes from the very word of God, repeating his promises again and again to one another. And that's not to downplay the helpfulness of a personal touch and care, but I fear we tend to overemphasize sometimes the value of these things. What needs to ring true is that the most solid and lasting encouragement comes not from emotional closeness, but from God's word and a right understanding of who God is. And this knowledge of God is especially important during times of doubt. 
It's during those times that Satan raises questions about the character of God and suggests that God stands opposed to our best interests. Ed Welch writes, We are left with a God, small g, who is a strange composite of truth, satanic lies, our projected desires and expectations, our experiences with our parents, and the accumulation of life's hurts. This is not the God of the cross who loved us while we were enemies. And this composite, this small g God of our own construction, will not sustain us. Jonathan comes to David, puts David's hand in God's hand by repeating to him God's promises. Listen again, verse 17. He said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel. We can't realize how impactful that could have been in David's life, where he was to hear that, to have Jonathan reaffirming the promise that David will be king, that his God is faithful, that he's a promise-keeping God. Jonathan offers the ministry of his presence while repeating the promises and assurances. Verse 18 tells us they then cut another covenant between the two of them. At that point, David stayed and Jonathan left, and that was the last time they would ever see each other. But it's comforting to me that this short time, this opportunity was deep and impactful. It's how God still works today in the midst of our troubles. Friends can be used by the Lord to bring us encouragement. Through their presence and their reminding us of God's promise. So, in conclusion, remember these three things. Doubt is normal. It doesn't make you an outlier. It doesn't make you strange. It makes you part of the family. Our spiritual ancestors were doubters. We come by it naturally. It doesn't diminish us as Christians, and it doesn't disqualify us for the work of the kingdom. But don't, don't dwell in it alone. Shout it to God. Share it with others. Be willing to talk about it to God as Jesus modeled. Christ is our model, as is Jonathan, secondly, for repenting, turning away from privilege and our comfort for the sake of being present in the lives of our friends who may be struggling. This can come at cost, but it's what self-forgetting friendship looks like. Finally, as we come alongside our friends, we have the opportunity of reminding them of God's promises and assuring them of his character. We get to be like Jesus to his disciples, explaining the things that he said, reminding them of the things that he had done. Ultimately, we get the privilege of being vessels of hope, of encouragement. Let me end with this. We are now owners of two rats by choice. They live in a cage. Uh, my son's birthday this past spring, he let us know that he wanted fancy rats. I had never heard those two words together in a sentence. I had images of cats wearing top hats watching Downton Abbey <laughs> with names like Benedict and Cumberbatch. <laughs> but we researched, we read quite a bit. Um, there's a whole subculture of YouTube channels that are awfully creepy. Um, <laughs> Ready Lover 6883 is especially creepy. <laughs> In the course of our research, we came upon how to potty train the rats, how to train the rats to tricks, um, and just, uh, in general, just fantastic facts about rats in water, including how they get through the New York City toilets. But one story in particular was striking. It was an experiment on wharf rats that I can only assume was pre-PETA, and ethical treatment of test subjects. In the experiment, the researchers placed the rats in a tub of water that they could not climb out of. They were forced to swim while water poured down on them, keeping them from rolling over on their back, because evidently rats can backflip. So they were forced to swim for the duration of the experiment. The rats swam until they died at 17 minutes of swimming. Another sample of rats repeated it, and what tended to happen where rats typically could swim for 17 minutes and they died. Another sample of rats were placed in the tub under the same conditions, but in this test, the rats were pulled out at the 16-minute mark, so just at the end of their rope. These rats were dried, they were fed, they were placed back in their cages to recover for a few days until, unfortunately, they had to go back in. 
These same rats, put back in the same tub under the same conditions, swam for 37 hours. That's hours, not minutes. Scientists concluded that the reason the rats were able to endure so much longer was because they had had a salvation experience, which gave them hope for a repeat experience. <laughs> Essentially, though, we see the rats were able to swim 37 hours instead of 17 minutes because they had hope of being saved yet again. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this, the Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. He needs him again and again when he becomes uncertain and discouraged. He needs his brother as a bearer and proclaimer of the divine word of salvation. What privilege that we are entrusted by the Lord to be vessels of his hope, of his message of salvation, conveyors of his gospel, bringers of comfort to his bruised and battered people. You never know what a reminder of his promises may mean to someone who is struggling, someone who's struggling in doubt. Let us hold to these truths, even in the midst of our doubts, and let us be prepared daily to die to self, to die to our convenience, to die to our comfort, and pursue and preach these truths to others so that they may have hope. May we be a community of Jonathans in how we extend friendship and a community of Davids in how we wrestle with our doubt and how we receive friendship. Go in peace. You're dismissed.